Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to our lecture series, Diversity in Higher Education. And as we're going into the final weeks of this semester, I want to look back and highlight a few points from the last session by Professor Striano and Professor Amoreo from the University of Naples, Federico Secondo. And there were many impressive points made in this lecture. And I think what stuck with us was the high level of resources on the topic of diversity owns at the New University of Naples. The focus was on disabilities and the center Synapsi, which provides support for students with disabilities in terms of employability, like supporting them in writing applications, making video as part of the application portfolio and so on. And at the same time, I think this is important to point out, the training was not only focused on students with disability, but also on the whole of the student and faculty body, offering awareness trainings, integrate the topic into teaching formats and providing other information about diversity. So it's not singling out a group which needs to be supported, but the importance is also raising awareness in the entire community. And one term was also important in the talk, which is well-being. Our speakers defined well-being with regard to campus climate, mental health, positive student experiences and development of identity. And certainly access to participation, inclusion is also part of well-being. And in looking back, I just want to raise a question, a more general question on well-being, which is a concept, um, I guess, well established in psychology and perhaps a little lesser known in the social sciences. And I think there is a need to adapt the concept to social sciences, jeopardize its normativity and historicize it. Wouldn't it be interesting to ask ourselves what future historians will regard as the good life at the beginning of the 21st century? And how does our idea of well-being differ to the one from, say, the 1950s or 1960s? What aspects have changed and what does this say about our society? Diversity and inclusion are fashionable terms, not only at universities. There is, however, a need for a historical and a cultural perspective on them, also a comparative perspective, which shows what diversity actually means in specific societies. And by comparing the universities from different national and cultural contexts, we get closer to those specifics of the concept and what it tells us about the society in which it is embedded. And today we will stay close to home and look at the University of Innsbruck and how diversity is understood and lived there. We are very happy to have the expert for questions of equal opportunities at the University of Innsbruck and Dirk will introduce Sabine Engel to you now. Yes, thank you Silke, a very warm welcome also from my side, welcome back to our uh, Brownback lecture series, I hope you all have your lunches ready. Um, and as Silke said, we are staying at home uh, with our very own Sabine Engel um, here today. Unfortunately, because as you can see in the program, uh, unfortunately, uh, Alexandra Weiss, very close colleague uh, to Sabine Engel uh, from the uh, Office for Gender Equality and Gender Studies, cannot be with us uh, today. So we sent her our greetings. Um, but um, Sabine Engel was kind enough to uh, um, to stay in the game, so to say, and um, and to take over uh, the challenge to uh, present this talk to us um, alone. Um, I think Alexander would have been important for the part of theory because we are talking again about theory and practice, one of our main. Uh, main topics here in that lecture series, as we found out. Um, I think Alexander would have been important for theory, um, but uh, I think Sabine will also manage that um, alone. So thanks for for staying with us, um, also without Alexandra. Uh, Sabine Engel um, studied uh, law at the University of Innsbruck and worked for some time as an assistant um, um, in the field of uh, civil law at our law faculty and she's a specialist in uh, university law and organizational uh, law and also for gender diversity and equal opportunity issues and around the year 2000 she moved to from research again from theory to practice uh, around 2000 she moved uh, 
from uh, um, from um, the research and teaching side to um, our administrative uh, staff and uh, she is part um, and head of our office for gender equality and gender studies and uh, head of the working committee for equal opportunity issues and as that is Silke already said uh, our main expert uh, in that field at the University of Innsbruck and we are really happy to have her here uh, today. So thanks for joining us and with that I leave the floor to you. Well a warm welcome from my side also and thank you Silke Meyer and the group for the friendly introduction. As you heard, the topic on which I'm expected to speak today is doing diversity from theory to practice. And that is precisely where an unexpected problem came up. The group now mentioned the colleague who was supposed to offer you the theoretical input from the social science view is unfortunately ill. I, as a person, can talk to you about some very basic theoretical fundamentals. But unlike Alexandra Weiss, I'm not a social scientist. My field of expertise is jurisprudence. I therefore ask for your understanding that you'll be confronted today with a sometimes changed emphasis on the theme. How can I click forward? Um, okay. First, a short introduction, a little bit talk about themes and basic concepts. Firstly, diversity means in this context a variety or plurality. There's a historical and social differentiations which divide people into groups, but we never belong only to one group. For example, a person can be chronically ill, a woman with working class background and heterosexual. All these classifications affect our social positioning and come along with discrimination. Social sciences talk about structural categories. Central categories in this context are gender, class and race or ethnicity. They organize our society and they have an effect on our social position in the society. That's important to be kept in mind. Institutions such as universities now have to and, as I can say for Innsbruck, want to deal with diversity and diversity management. Students and staff are getting more and more diverse. Diversity is also a cross-cutting issue and it matters in all areas, in teaching and research as well as in the administration of a university. Discrimination I'm from the field of law, we love the definitions, means any disadvantages, differentiation, different treatment without objective justification. The linchpin is the objective justification. Not every unequal treatment is to be equated with discrimination. For example, if young people under the age of 18 are denied the sale of alcohol or women can't become a taxi driver because she does not have a driver's license or a political group is banned because it glorifies violence and encourages crimes, then this is no age discrimination, discrimination on ground of gender or worldview. Rather, such forms of unequal treatment are objectively justified by legitimate goals of a democratic society, such as ensuring security and order, preventing criminal offense, protecting health, and so on. Dimensions of diversity, which are explicitly mentioned in Austrian law, are age, color, gender, ethnicity, religion and worldview, sexual orientation, disability and health impairment. These dimensions are standing under legal protection by Austrian and EU law. We'll learn more about this later. Important is to keep in mind that not all dimensions of diversity are visible. We have also to cope with not visible dimensions, for example, worldview. 
I would like to invite you to take a closer look at one of those not visible dimensions, the social background. The dimension social background got more attention in the last years. Also, there is almost no legal basis on this topic. It became an important political objective. We know that students at the university are predominantly members of middle class households or more specific children of academics. The percentage of those who are students with working class background, farm or migrant background is very low at Austrian universities and has been declining for a few years. A research project, I think there was also an Aurora lecture about it, at the University of Innsbruck on the access of disadvantaged groups and the allocation of students by social class verified this trend, even for the Tyrolean higher education area. It was a study of Brandmeier, Hanselmann and müller kmet Reasons may also be located in a more difficult socio-economic situation and rising social inequality. But it was also a topic which was often neglected by the universities in the past. Within the framework of the Bologna process, the European Union paid more attention to the question of the social dimension on higher education. First mentioned in the Bologna communique of Prague in 21, it came to a resolution in 2015. Every member state is asked to develop a national strategy to improve the social dimension in higher education. The aims are, as you can see, to create a variety of learning opportunities for different students, to increase the freedom to choose between the different educational sectors, to achieve a balance between the sexes and to promote access and degree for disadvantaged groups. That is one of the reasons why we do what we are doing now, trying to manage diversity. Now we have talked about categories of dimensions of diversity. It is important to know these and to know which categories a legal rule or scientific research is referring to. But because there are or can be reasons of inequality and discrimination. But if we were interacting with others, we shouldn't think in these categories. Why? The risk is that we essentialize differences. That means that it can come to stereotyping and homogenizing of specific groups, so that we look at individuals through a filter. It's quite the same question as with prejudices. They target to groups, but they hurt the individual. This is a mechanism which causes us to attribute individuals specific qualities which are linked to discriminated groups in our society. An example for this mechanism is a presumption that students with migration background have low language competence. Therefore, the reconnection of diversity competence to the research fields in diversity, intersectionality and gender are very important because these are the most innovative research areas within the topic. To avoid the risk of essentialism and homogenization, intersectionality is the method of the choice. Intersectionality was developed by Kimberly Crenshaw. Kimberly Crenshaw, you see her at the right hand side, is an American civil rights advocate and a leading scholar of critical race theory since about 1989. Intersectionality became a very extensive research area within gender studies and found its way also into our jurisdiction. Crenshaw's focus on intersectionality is on how the law responds to issues that include gender and race discrimination. We remember Crenshaw comes from black feminist movement. The particular challenge in law was that anti-discrimination laws looked at gender and on race separately and consequently African-American women or other women of color experienced overlapping forms of discrimination 
and the law, unaware of how to combine the two, left these women without any justice. Anti-discrimination laws and the justice systems attempt for a remedy to discrimination were limited and operated on a singular axis. When one flows into another, a complete and understandable definition hasn't been written in law. Starting point for Crenshaw was the case of black women who were sacked by their employer. Anti-discrimination laws at that time had no effect because they knew only discriminations by race or discrimination by sex. But when these two categories came together, there was no legal basis to act. Therefore, Crenshaw created the term intersection. You're not on one single road, but in the middle, when two roads come together, you might be hurt. We talked already about it. People are not only men, only Christians, only old, etc., etc. Discrimination can have several causes. It can be multiple discrimination for several reasons or intersectional discrimination for a combination of reasons. Dealing with this particular category is really difficult. Let me give you an example, quite simple, for multiple discrimination. An employer does not employ foreigners and he doesn't employ women. A foreign woman is discriminated against for several reasons. Intersectional discrimination means an employer generally hires women. He hires men, he hires foreigners, he doesn't cope about religion, but he doesn't hire foreign women who wear a headscarf. So the combination of women, foreigner, and signs of religious affiliation leads to the discrimination. And that was the kind of problem law couldn't cope with for a long time. If I complain and say I'm not hired because I'm a woman, the employer would say, why? There's Mrs. Meyer and Mrs. Huber and Mrs. Fetter. I hire women. And I say, okay, but I'm foreigner. And he says, so why? There is Mr. Mahmoud and there is Mrs. Hagius daughter. I hire foreigners. And if I say it's of course of my religion, he says, why? One of our employees is Catholic, the other is Muslim, one is Hindu. And the combination of ground wasn't protected by law. What Crenshaw's approach teaches us is that we have to analyze the social situation and which effect group memberships have in a specific situation on a specific individual. Not all identities we have are all our group memberships. We are relevant at any time. An intersectional approach means that concrete challenges people face are named. In this way, dimensions of diversity will not be fixed because they have relevance only in specific situations. In the meantime, Crenshaw's image of the crossing roads, the intersection, is viewed critically as it suggests a clear separation of the individual experiences of discrimination, the streets as strands, and is too often interpreted only as an addition of the categories. At the same time, the specific legal context of Crenshaw's analysis, as I do think, is often ignored. As a result of this criticism, the concept of interdependence is proposed. Interdependence is rather focused on the intervening of the interactions and mutual dependencies between and within the categories themselves. This is a draft theoretical input from my point, but now let me show you how we try to deal with diversity at the University of Innsbruck. As I'm from the field of law, first of all, you'll have to face some legal framework. Diversity and anti-discrimination you can find in UN and EU legislation. For example, the European Convention on Human Rights, the Treaty of Amsterdam, 
the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Even you find rules in our constitution, in our basic law on December 1867, very long ago, where is laid down, all nationals are equal before the law. Even in the federal constitutional law, we call it BVG, Bundesverfassungsgesetz, it said all nationals are equal before the law, privileges based upon birth, sex, estate, class, or religion are excluded. You see, most categories of discrimination are named there. No one shall be discriminated against because of his disability. The Republic commits itself to ensuring the equal treatment of disabled and non-disabled person in any spheres of everyday life. And the Federation provides and manipulates subscribe to the de facto equality of men and women, that's the legal basis for women promoting, measures to promote factual equality of women and men, in particular by eliminating actually existing inequalities, are admissible. Then at universities, relevant is a special act, the federal law on equal treatment, we call it Bundesgleichbehandlungsgesetz. It applies to all persons employed with federal authorities, even at the universities, or applying for employment or training with federal authorities, and it forbids discrimination on grounds of gender, age, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religion, or beliefs. What does it mean? On ground of gender means any kind of unequal treatment on grounds of gender, in particular with reference to the martial status or the fact whether someone has children is prohibited. The term gender comprises women, men and transsexual persons. It's, I think, important to know. On grounds of age, the prohibition of discrimination applies to all age groups, prohibiting discrimination against both elder and younger persons. On grounds of sexual orientation, any kind of unequal treatment on grounds of sexual orientation is prohibited. Sexual orientation refers to heterosexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality. So protection concerns in particular lesbian and gay persons. On ground of ethnicity, any kind of unequal treatment on grounds of ethnicity is prohibited. Why do we call it ethnicity? Due to the negative connotation of the term race in German usage, the original wording of the EU directive, which was race, has been discarded in favor to the term ethnicity. In any case, discrimination motivated by racism is of course prohibited. On grounds of ethnicity includes also discriminations related to skin color, affiliation, nationality, language, name or other external characteristics. On ground of religion does not only mean belonging to a specific religious community or denomination or persons holding specific beliefs or opinions. Any kind of unequal treatment on groups of religion or belief is prohibited. This definition does or not only refer to churches and recognized religious communities, but also to other religious groups. Then the discrimination on grounds of disability, I think it's interesting, is not laid down in that federal law on equal treatment, as it is in the same regulation within the EU but in a specific law, which is called Disability Equality Act and Disability Employment Act. But the main theory is the same. It is forbidden to discriminate persons because of a disability or because of a physical or mental impairment that is not transitory. Other rules you'll find in our University Act, which is our organizational basic law. And there we find that the guiding principles to be observed by the universities and pursuance of their objects are 
Ziffer 9, equality of the sexes, equality of social opportunity, which is interesting because we don't find it in the federal law, and special attention to the needs of the handicapped. As you see, legal protection against discrimination is not that bad in Austrian law, but that alone is not enough. We may look on diversity perhaps as a coin with two sides. Diversity management always aims in two directions. On the one hand, it is intended to eliminate structural discrimination against people. This is because institutions such as universities have been characterized for a long time by explicit and implicit exclusions from certain groups of people. These imprints do not disappear automatically because legal framework conditions are changed and now follow perhaps more democratic principles. On the other hand, diversity management also should make opportunities and chances visible. Because powerful exclusions, discrimination, usually leads to potential remaining unrecognized and not being able to develop, to the detriment of those who are affected, to the detriment of the institution, and last but not least of the society. Unlike legislation that is implemented through sanctions, diversity management is a voluntary organizational action. It is self-initiated by organizations with a workforce from different ethnicities, religions, nationalities and demographics. So we need both measures against discrimination, but also an active policy. That is also the reason why diversity management plays a role in our basic strategy documents. These are mission statement, development plan, performance agreements and the charter on social diversity. First, let me quote our mission statement because I like it very much. I find it beautiful. There is said, the university is and lives from diversity in biographies, ideas, life plans, opinions and methods which we promote through gender equality, inclusion and compatibility of work and study with care responsibilities. This diversity is a prerequisite for an insightful and inspiring study, scientific excellence and recognition by society. At Leopold Franzen's University Innsbruck, we act as a role model and actively support an open society. Great expectations, let's have a look up on our efforts to fulfill these expectations. There was second strategic document, our development plan. The strategic direction into which the university is to go is laid down in these development plans where the main strategies for future milestones are mapped out for several years. As you see, the actual plan is for 2022 up to 2027. Thus, it's a basis for performance agreements concluded between the University and the Ministry of Science and Research on the one hand, and the guideline for target agreements between the faculties and the rectorate on the other hand. I'll show you an excerpt of our development plan. I think it's a little bit difficult to read. It is said that the University of Innsbruck sees itself as a diversity conscious, inclusive and participatory research and educational institution. It is committed to a comprehensive equality approach with regard to all dimensions of diversity and to strategic diversity management with appropriate structures in order to create equal access to the university, to reduce structural disadvantages, but also to make possibilities and opportunities visible, the second side of the coin. By avoiding exclusion and discrimination, undetected potential can be used for the benefits of those affected, the institution, and last but not least, the society. 
So your university diversity policy places particular emphasis on gender equality and inclusion. These are two topics we focus mainly on. This includes gender mainstreaming and awarded methods of promoting the career of employees and students and above all for people with health problems. The promotion of social permeability will continue to be actively promoted. Diversity also arises from interdisciplinary research and teaching as well as interregional and international corporations. However, the aim of a non-discriminatory and equal opportunities university requires constant critical self-reflection and conscious further development on the organization. The two goals of the development plan, excellence in teaching and excellence in research, are to be seen in the context of the university's overall social responsibilities from which the corresponding deductions and tasks arise in the sense of, we call it, third mission. Central cross-sectional issues, namely internalization, sustainability, digitalization and diversity, as well as personal and infrastructural support, the achievement of goals. These cross-sectional matters were distributed to five members of the rectorate for processing in the period between 2022 and 2024 and further processed in the respective departments. The aim was to create a strategy document or a concept for the further development of all these cross-cutting issues tasks at the end of 2021. We'll have a closer look on the development of the strategic document later. First, we'll look at the performance agreements. This is a contract under public law. It's concluded between the University of Innsbruck and the Republic of Austria for a three-year period. It forms the basis for the work program of the university and determines also, and that is important, the available budget. The university has committed itself, among other things, for the following projects. Maintaining and expanding strength in gender equality and in inclusion and empowerment of disabled persons, as it was also written down in the development plan. Implementation of a comprehensive gender and diversity monitoring. Training offers in field of diversity and themed events. You see, now we come a little bit closer to detailed measures. We have to report on our progress in the implementation of these projects in the Intellectual Capital Report every year. This is, yeah, how to explain it serves to holistically present, evaluate and communicate in material properties of the university performance processes and their impacts. In addition, it's a qualitative and quantitative basis for establishing and concluding the performance agreement. Also, already here, two sides of a coin. Performance agreement on the one hand. On the other hand, the, intellect, the intellectual capacity grant. And Last but not least, the last strategic document, in 2015, the University of Innsbruck adopted a Charter on Social Diversity. Well, we have now got to know some of our strategic documents, but how do we really concretely implement the goals contained therein in practice? Efforts to manage diversity have been going on at our university for a long time. We are striving for gender equality since the 1990s. Then in 2014, we had a quality audit. That was an external evaluation by experts who gave us the following feedback. The expert group recommends developing gender equality policy into a policy or better still, a culture 
of dealing with diversity as managing diversity. That was the point where Rector Tillmann Melk asked us, that means Alexandra Weiss and me, to take care of the subject and make some proposals how to work with it. The first steps we took were collecting what activities were already existing at our university and we were really surprised how much it was, you know, universities are somehow uh, structurally diffuse organizations with so much faculties and in every faculty, in so many departments of the administration, there were efforts in topic of diversity, but sometimes they didn't know of each other and they weren't visibly on one point. So that was our second step. We tried to make them more visible. Therefore, we collected them on a special website. You can find our measures and initiatives here. And you can also give suggestions and get more information. To realize concrete aims in managing diversity in 2017, there was also a steering group set up. Who are members of these steering groups? Various stakeholders. For example, a person from Austrian Students' Union the disabled persons representatives, persons from the family service, from the Office of Gender Equality and Gender Studies, from student services, our university medical officer, members of the working committee of equal opportunity issues, persons from both works councils for faculty and for staff, the vice rector for human resources, the vice rector for teaching and students, many deans, persons from various administration offices. So this group tries to push forward the aim of a diversity management. And here you can see our diversity web page, where you can find about diversity activities at our university. But diversity isn't that nice as it looks on that homepage. It's not free of conflicts. It's not a peaceful side by side of different groups and individuals. In our society, differences come along with power structures, hierarchies, with different approaches to the access to resources and social rooms, with an attribution of characteristics, the allocation of different functions, chances. The social power structures come along with social inequality and our cultural disregard. And we have also to decide how much diversity can we stand as a university. Attitudes you perhaps all know, like I'm no racist, sexist or classist. For me, all human people are equal and not helpful at all. Why? Because these attitudes might show that a person is not willing to think about exclusion, devaluation or hierarchies in our society and which impact social structures have. Our thinking and acting is shaped by this structure. And the only way to avoid discrimination is to reflect on these social processes and our own position within these social structures. That means also that discrimination is not always or perhaps rarely a conscious action. So it doesn't make sense to discuss these problems in terms of individual guilt. The challenge is to understand ourselves as individuals located in a specific historical and social characterized area. Therefore, our aim in managing diversity was among university members, a viability and equality of people in terms of gender, race, age, ethnic origin, disabilities, religion, family status, social status should exist. A prerequisite for this is implementing a culture in which individuals are viewed as a valuable asset and not as an obstacle. Now let me tell you about a milestone in these efforts in diversity management in the last year, 2028. I already told you about central cross-sectional issues in our development plan. 
namely internalization, sustainability, digitalization and diversity, that were distributed to the five members of the rectorate for processing in the 2020-2024 rectorate period and further processed in the departments. The aim was to create a strategy document as a concept for the further development of these cross-cutting issues at the end of 2021. In case of diversity, Vice Rector of Human Resources, Professor Anna Buchheim, was a person of duty. She initiated a process that combined a top-down and a bottom-up strategy in a let me say, really laborious and complex process. Let me show how it worked. First, we formed a preparatory group. It was Vice Rector Anna Buchheim, Alexandra Weiss and me from the Office for Gender Equality and Gender Studies, the group no, here with us today, and an assistant of Vice Rector Buchheim, Daniela Binoholza, and we tried to develop the strategic fields of action which should be later on discussed in focus groups. In order to ensure integration with existing structures, we held a kickoff meeting with the Extended Diversity Management Steering Group in April 2021. Afterwards, it came to the setting of the focus groups. It was important for us to ensure broad participation, bottom-up strategy. We were able to motivate about 50 experts from our university to participate in the focus groups, as well as to invite selected colleagues from other universities, such as University of Duisburg-Essen, University of Graz, University of Music and Performing Arts in Vienna, for keynote speeches. As an example, the UDE has specific expertise in the implementation of diversity monitoring. The University of Music and Performing Arts Vienna developed an interesting presentation on its diversity strategy at one glance. University of Graz worked intensively on the development of code of conduct. I'll give you a more detailed report on our work in the focus group soon. The results of the discussions in the focus groups were incorporated by the members of the preparatory group into the strategy paper which is subsequently discussed and approved by the rectorate. Afterwards, there was a joint event, we called it Sync with Us, in November 21. After the drafts of all the strategy documents on the cross-cutting issues, internalization, sustainability, digitalization and diversity have been developed in the vice rectorates, on Tuesday, November the 9th, the rectorate presented these drafts to the university public in a joint event under the title Think with us from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. in the aula and also as an online discussion and discussed the draft with all interested university members. Afterwards, now there should be presentations of the draft in the Senate and the University Council next month in February 2022. Now let's have a short closer look on the work of the focus groups. The focus groups work in these areas, awareness rising, HR, students monitoring, and code of conduct. About six months from May to October, we took a lot of time to think about our strengths, but also weaknesses, about opportunities and limitations. You might call it a SWOT analysis and to work out relevant fields of action with possible measures for our university. Each focus group met three times for about four hours. That's why I talk of a laborious process. Who participated in the focus groups? Various experts and stakeholders, for example, members of the rectorate, scientists of various faculties, members of the Senate, staff development employees, staff from the personal department, students, members of working committees, members of the Equal Opportunities Issues Committee, 
disabled persons representatives, members of International Relation Office of the Research Platform Center Interdisciplinary Gender Studies at our university, people from public relations, and so on and so on. This is a slide from the presentation of November the 9th, Sync with Us, on which you can find the names of the internal members of the focus group. I tried to count, I think it were around about 50 persons. Now I'd like to show you briefly, as to come to an end, the results of the focus group as they were presented at the event Sync with Us in November. The Code of Conduct group was primarily concerned with the aim of bringing together existing guidelines on energy equality, equal opportunities, anti-discrimination and inclusion in a more visible way. Since a non-discriminatory, appreciative and diversity conscious cooperation is an essential basis for all fields of action, we have later on decided to include this approach as a guiding principle in the preamble of the university strategy. You can see our self-image as it was found out by the group and the guiding principles intersectionality to avoid stereotypes and a code of conduct as a non-discriminatory, appreciative and diversity conscious cooperation. The second focus group was Awareness Rising. The aim was to strengthen awareness of diversity at our university sustainably. University is a social space that promotes an appreciative approach to diversity and perceives it as an enrichment. Not a view on deficits, but as an enrichment. The fields of activities worked out where gender diversity, social dimension as one focus, promotion of plural culture, raising awareness, advanced training, public relations, more intensive networking of relevant actors, which I personally think is very much important, and the extension of the service and welcome culture. In the context of public relations, there are already two very prominent projects a diversity week planned for June 22 in cooperation with the city of Innsbruck and the Aurora Lecture section, in which I have the pleasure to talk with you today. Then there was a group Human Resources. The aim was making sure a diverse staff structure. The topic of Human Resources is particularly a practice release and the university already has achieved a lot in this field. On the other hand, we have to operate in really tight legal corset in this area in particular. The focus group has picked out three areas of activity, employer branding, recruiting, and development and career opportunities for all employees, means scientific staff as well as administrative staffs. The student group has as aims the composition of the students and graduate should reflect the composition of society, which is really an ambitious aim. The heterogeneity and diversity of the students are perceived as strengths. As fields of activity, they worked out analysis of the structural framework and university culture. Quality assured permeability, including access to university, promotion of structural studiability, making curricula more flexible, also very important, I think, promoting the participation of underrepresented student groups and support for our teaching staff. Last but not least, the monitoring group, whose aim was the establishment of a targeted diversity monitoring for employees and students. We should analyze existing surveys and university statistical data with regard to aspects relevant to diversity. Also will be important an analysis of quantitative and qualitative data relevant to diversity and if necessary additional surveys. One problem of course in this context is the availability of the respective data, especially for reasons of data protection law. We can't ask our students, are you from a white class household? 
we can't ask our staff, excuse me, are you gay? Not very good idea. But these were the basic work of the focus groups. Now, how will it go on? Smaller working groups will continue to work on the development, on the measures in the respective fields of action, as well as us on corresponding indicators of measurability. Some projects, as I told you, have already started. And what is really important to us, internal and external cooperation should be built up. The keynote speeches from experts from other universities were very, very stimulating for us. We are looking forward to collaborate with as many Aurora universities as possible and expect, for example, synergy effects in the cooperation with the University of Duisburg Essen with regard to a joint data comparison in the area of diversity monitoring or student data and the joint development of a diversity monitoring in the area of personal. The primary goal of awareness raising will be to achieve a sustainable implementation of the daily experience of diversity at this university. Connecting our strategy with other cross-cutting issues will also mean an important challenge. For example, in the era of social dimension with the student life cycle, or in the area of HL with the internationalization and digitalization strategy, or in the area of social competence and in dealing with resources with the sustainability strategy. Now, here I am at the end of my presentation. Let me thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking us uh, on, on this tour of our very own university and um, showing us projects and, and, uh, and details and also the process behind these projects and details. I think it's, it's very important to, um, to raise an awareness also for this diversity, although the wish for diversity is not just there and, uh, you know, everybody thinks it's a good idea and uh, it's kind of a, you know, just happens to be um, uh, the, the fashion of, of, of our times, but uh, there is a process behind this. This has a legal framework. And um, we are uh, at, at different stages also in this process. And also, um, thank you for, for for your introduction. For your uh, at the beginning, you said that um, diversity um, has principles. That equal opportunities has certain principles, which are again culturally and historically embedded. Um, and there are groups that we sort of legally discriminate against. There are groups that are excluded. And I mean, in, in our times, we have a very vivid debate on, um, you know, the principles of liberty. Do I have to wear a mask? Do I have to go and get myself vaccinated? And, and, and all these questions, which, um, uh, which actually show us what, uh, 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 <laughs> that we're in the middle of, right in the middle of sort of making, making society and, and social change. And, uh, I mean, you, and you, you mentioned some examples that, um, you know, that you can't do everything and um, there are some grounds where you are sort of legally excluded when you, your violent behavior is legally excluded and other, but the, uh, the, the principles of what is violence and what's the right kind of violence and the wrong kind of violence. I mean, this is, this is all, I mean, this is right the middle of, of what we're talking about, isn't it? I mean, diversity is not just there and because we like it because it's such a feel good term and inclusion also feels good. Who can be against inclusion? Who can be against well-being, against all this? But these are concepts we really have to f fight for when we define them. And this is what I think is, is, is interesting also when you talk about the legal side of it, because the law regulates it, but also the law has to change in order to regulate it. Mm -hmm. So this, I think this, these are very, very important uh, questions. Dirk, do you want to? How, 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 how do we put that into a question for us? No, no, it's, 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 not, a, it's not a question. It's, it, I was just, I, I I was just I trying to uh, try to answer a little bit. You're completely right. This is one of the main 
topics in dealing with discrimination, even in legal terms. And quite nowadays, discrimination has become a fashionable term. Everything where I'm not content is discrimination. And if I have to wear a mask, I'm discriminated, for example. And as I told you, the linchpin is the objective justification. And that was always and ever have been a historical argument and nothing which is written in stone. For example, between First and Second World War, there was a jurisdiction of Supreme Court in Austria, OGH. It was about uh, cigarettes. There were cards with which you can buy cigarettes. And the cards for men were about 50 cigarettes, and for women only about 10. And there was a female smoker, and she went to the Supreme Court and said, why I'm discriminated? Why should men get more cigarettes than me? And that you'll have to take into account that it was, this wasn't only for to smoke, it was also a material worth thing, because you can sell cigarettes. But there were really studies that at that time, women significantly smoke less than men. So the Supreme Court said, the different put um, cigarettes to men and to women is all right. There's an objective justification because men smoke more. And what's fascinating, at that time, the Supreme Court was right. It was a other social situation. In our days, as far as I know, more women than men smoke and the decision would be either. So that is always the question where law comes to its limits. What is really objective? That is a question which has to be dealt out in society, not in law. And that is also the problem why it's so difficult if people always call for legislation to solve, solve social problems. Of course, it's better they are solved by law as by the market in some contexts. But law can't substitute a discourse in the society. Mm. Uh, I was thinking perhaps we can take the, the first question from the audience because it um, um, because it seems to fit uh, fit in into to this point. Um, I'm just going to read it out to you uh, when hiring faculty and of course the hiring uh, committees are I suppose are, um, uh, are an important area for the arena for this. When hiring faculty, how do you handle questions of positive discrimination? It's another fashionable term. For example, in terms of gender, and is there a critical debate on the women's, uh, women's uh, promotion plan? Okay, thank you for the question. First, uh, we, if we talk about positive discrimination, we can only talk about gender, because it's the only field in which positive discrimination is legally allowed in Austria. Mm -hmm. We can't have positive discrimination, for example, on disabled persons, because there is no legal grounding for it. How do we handle it? I think there are quite many misunderstandings about affirmative or positive discrimination, affirmative actions. As I experience, the reason is that often uh, People who decide in hiring processes are not very courageful. They decide not to hire a male applicant and they said, oh, Mr. XY, you were really the best candidate yet, but you know, this terrific women promotion plan forced me to choose Mrs. XY. What you'll have to know is that a prior hiring of a woman is only possible if women are underrepresented in this group. 
for example, as a student, student staff tutor or what else at faculty of literature, there was no chance to promote women because they have enough women. It's only when there's underrepresentation and the female candidate has to be as good in her qualification as the best male candidate. And that is often not known. Also, there is a credible debate on the women's promotion plan. It has always been, and I think it will always exist when I am dead for about 100 years. <laughs> But that's in, in the principle of the state now. And the question on the awareness training, as far as I know, that is going to start in the next several years. For teaching staff, there have been the first trainings, but that would have been a question for Alexandra Weiss, who worked as a trainer. Mm -hmm. Um, just to read it out, there was a question about uh, if there are awareness trainings for diversity at the University of Innsbruck, like we heard, um, uh, heard it last week, uh, not last week, but last, uh, last session. And um, I know that there are for, for faculty and staff, but um, and, uh, as I gather from what you were saying, that they will be implemented for also for students or for a broader audience. But uh, can I just ask, um, because you just said the, the uh, affirmative action or positive discrimination um, uh, only exists in, in the terms of gender. Um, in terms of age, let me just think, of course, you know, you, you couldn't say you wanted somebody... Um, oh, no, so there is only gender as a, uh, as, as a field for that. So you can't, for example, give an advertise and say we we would like to specially take other people, people who come back into job after family pause. You can invite these people mm -hmm. to apply for a post, but you can't say if there is a person middle aged and an elder person, I would prefer the elder person because of her age. That's not mm -hmm. allowed. Mm -hmm. There's only one exception that is for persons who, uh, I don't know the English term for Lehrlinge. There you can oh, no. Apprentice, person. I think. Yeah. Apprentice uh, says, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, As you uh, remember, there is a promotion of gender as a special point of discrimination is written down in our constitution. And the mm -hmm. reason why it is written down in the constitution that it is possible to do positive actions is just because otherwise a man who wouldn't get a job could complain and said, I'm discriminated because of my sex or of my gender. Mm -hmm. It needed really that being down laid as an action positively in our constitution to make that possible. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, th I think we said many times now it's so fashionable to talk about diversity and it's also so fashionable to talk about discrimination. And um, at the same time, we see this enormous, I mean, it's a mass of different laws and regulations and papers and strategies we, we, um, we have to deal with. Um, can you maybe just by looking back at the, at the more than 20 years you are now in that business, Give us a little a historical perspective. Um, what has really changed in your view over these more than 20 years now since the beginning of this century? I mean, is there really a substantial change with all these papers and regulations or is it more uh, uh, more on the surface? Uh, 
um, a little bit here, a little bit there, there another paper, but no real substantial change when it comes to the overall, you know, organization of the university to, to faculty and students and so on. Uh, it's difficult to say it's just a feeling, not a scientific proof. I think there has changed something in the awareness of many people. Perhaps 10, 15 years ago, when I was in an admission committee, for example, and there were remarks, perhaps discriminating to women. I should have to act. If this happens now, three other members of the commission says, no, that's not okay. And what I find interesting, it's quite more easy to talk about the other dimensions of diversity. For example, disability or age or belief, sexual orientation, and everybody says, oh yeah, fine, fine, we need diversity. Talking about gender, there's much more reverse from the persons. And I think it's also more seen as a danger. Women at a university are more dangerous than disabled persons, because they are more. They are 15% from the person who has to give out offices and... <laughs> and that's good. But again, it always comes down to the resources, and um, there's um, there's a, a wonderful study by uh, a colleague, um, a very famous colleague, a U.S. American sociologist, Ali Russell Hochschild, who talked uh, to, um, and she's a, I mean she's a liberal left wing uh, sociologist uh, from from California. and she talked to Trump supporters and uh, members of the Tea Party as an ethnographic study. And, and ask them basically just plain, I mean, what are you complaining about? I mean, you've been the majority, you, you have, you've had everything for hundreds of years, um, male, white, um, middle class people. And, um, uh, and, and she really took the time and, and listened to their arguments and to their logics. And then it, it is, it, it's, and she said, it, it's this feeling that you, like you stand in line and you've been waiting for hours and then somebody, called um, the person who's been standing behind you because it's a woman, because she's in a wheelchair, because she's black, because she's gay. She's, and, and this being left behind, um, and I mean, you know, you can ask yourself the question if, if you want to talk to Trump supporters and Tea Party people, um, but I think if you want to understand society and um, how this changes in society and, and how, I mean, this there's also a big debate uh, about um, how society is divided uh, in, in social terms, then you really have to try and understand um, how these different principles are weighed against each other. And I mean, just not to be uh, wrongly understood here, I'm in no mean want to, want to spend my time talking to Trump supporters, but I think from, from a social science point of view, it's, it is important to, to understand the changes. But it's 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 of course amazing that the Trump supporters don't see that the others have also the feeling that they stand in line all the time, and never get to the point where they are really invited in, right? So that's uh, that's of course the amazing phenomenon, right? Just to see yourself standing in the line and your position in the line, and not uh, the position of the others, and why they are in the line behind you. Usually. Well, I think it might be no fun to talk to such persons, but unfortunately it's necessary because mm -hmm. the yeah. feeling of loss is real and they are too much people to ignore. And if you don't talk to them, you'll put them almost more in an extreme way of thinking. I think this, uh, this in a nutshell, could have been the la the last five to ten years in in the U.S. Right. Exactly. I mean, there is there there was exactly this analysis that uh, you know they people felt, um, and it's of course um, it's a strange idea that the majority, the perceived majority, feels like a min minority, feels suppressed, excluded, not listened to, not not appreciated. 
but as you said, I mean, it's, it's, it is a lot of people and they can make a difference and then they voted Trump. Yeah, but they had a lot of advantages, but they never realized they had advantages and now they lose them and that's what they realize. It's quite natural, I think. Absolutely, yeah. Do we have another? Difficult with our theme of diversity, because on the one hand we like diverse staff, diverse students at the university, but what we shouldn't do is to exclude, for example, a talented young man from middle class background with mom and dad academics. He shouldn't be left behind. And she shouldn't feel left behind. And that is one of the challenges, I think, also of diversity management. That you don't think it's only and just for people of color, people with migrant background, gay people. And me, I'm normal and I'm left back. Mm -hmm. That's a danger. Perhaps this term of well-being is really quite uh, quite useful in that term because well-being, of course, um, yeah, can can means that development for growth, for identity, developing identity, and uh, for positive you know, culture. Uh, and um, it doesn't it, it doesn't really focus on the differences. I mean, I mean, this has been when I think about migration study, this has been one of the the downfalls since the beginning of the 1970s. And it, it was always the focus on differences, and differences meaning deficits, of course. Yeah. So um, and then we, we started out with deficits, then we t and then we went on to differences. But still, it's, it's always on on making the other the other rather than, you know, talking about the community, the, the entire body. And, um, and also, that, that's what I liked about the, the, uh, the, the um, talk from last uh, session about Naples, that they offer these awareness trainings, really make it, make it a, a, a demandatory for everybody. So this is not, you don't have, a diversity management doesn't mean managing minorities. Yeah. <laughs> it, it means managing the majority, yeah. After all, even this can only work with people, let me say, who like diversity or think diversity as positive as well. Diversity is very tricky. How to cope, for example, with religious beliefs that think uh, women wouldn't have to work or being gay is a sin. And other one, on the other hand, we say we want to be diverse and we want to integrate our religious beliefs. It's also not that easy cheesy as we wish it could be. So after all, it's not really a, a theme of feeling well. It's also a, f a field of minds. Mm. But it seems to be both, right? So it's at the one hand we have this idea it's uh, um, it's uh, it's nice to be the words, and the other hand we always see that there are also limits to it. So it's a it's an extremely ambivalent um, um, ambivalent topic, right? Also how it is perceived in the um, in the public. Um, so that's that's so interesting, I think, right? At the same, at one, you know, on the one hand, it's it is so present; everybody likes it. At the same time, uh, we still need uh, thousands of regulations uh, for for very small steps forward in that respect. Mm -hmm. Although everybody seems to like it, so it's a, it's a very interesting. Uh, um, there's a very interesting ambivalence in it somehow, somehow, right? Well, and I think the only solution for this problem is really an open discussion of the problems. And that's of course... Otherwise, you, you come to cosmetics. Right. I call it United Colors of Benetton Diversity. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We already have that. Uh, we have one person with a headscarf, we have one other person, and they are alibis. 
Yeah, and I think it, it's especially interesting when you talk about um, uh, university and access to university, when you ask yourself, uh, who should go to university? And I mean, I know we had one colleague who said whoever wants to be there and right. um, uh, and I think that's that's uh, that's very admirable and, and right but there are of course I mean there are limits of um, uh, of places at university and we have a well-established uh, system to you know, we have matura and we have uh, grades from schools and so and so on and so on um, still it doesn't of course reflect personalities not entirely um, and, um, uh, and and we have to we have to lead this this debate. And I also think it's it's there's no point in in pretending uh, this is a sort of uh, well, this is a happy clappy uh, term that we there. And really, we have to point to the edges and where it hurts and and where it also hurts us. I mean, when I um, and there are situations in teaching where, of course, a homogenous group is a lot easier. Mm. And uh, you know, you bring them also. You might get to other, um, get more out of them. Mm. And a very diverse group needs a lot of attention in in different ways. And you really have to um, jeopardize and challenge your own beliefs and your own um, habits, of course, you know, because you've always done it like this. And now you have a different group, and then you have to do it differently. So it's it, it it's a challenge, and that's a constant challenge. But what you mentioned now is just a point why I think it's so important that we choose social background as one basic topic of our diversity strategy. It's really a pity Alexandra isn't there because she would have been able to talk with you about Bourdieu, his studies to social background and critical educational sociology dealing with social inequality and the access to universities. Our university is still dominantly male, middle class and white. And what can we do to change this? Because most of the exclusions are not formal. They are informal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we can't, uh, we, also we can't choose the groups we want to integrate. I had a, a, a doctorate uh, um, seminar with two and, and and there were two guys from the Identitaire Bewegung in oh. this and uh, they were very eloquent and uh, you know had a lot of a lot of opinion and um, I basically ended up just debating them fighting with them the entire semester and it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a good class I don't think anybody was happy in it I mean uh, there were some who kind of you know fought and then there was some and, and the, you know, the level of debate was high and that was good in a way, but we didn't actually get to the points we wanted to because we there was there were always um, there was always a subtext uh, of, 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 of which was very very difficult. But of course, I can't say. I mean, these are people that are enrolled at the university. I can't say I don't want to have you in my class because you have the wrong beliefs. But I think that's a problem if you have people who want to discuss or people who want to dispute. And perhaps the identitarian students mm. would like to dispute, but not to discuss yes. um, to a common solution. Mm. Yeah. Well, this is what they are interested in, obviously, right? So it's not, they are not interested in the topic, I guess, but... Yeah. Well, I mean, um, to be honest, they were quite... Uh, and I don't I think it's, 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 that's entirely true. They were interested in the topic, and they also they read all the they, they read mm -hmm. all the texts, and they they obviously also had a training in debating mm -hmm. and a disputing, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was quite hard sometimes uh, without actually going to the grounds where I wouldn't normally go. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't reproach the students for uh, for their beliefs. I can only I can only discuss with them what they're saying. I can't say you know I don't I'm, I'm not going to talk to you because you are Protestant or Catholic or Muslim or identitaire. So it, it really is um, it really challenges you as a teacher as well. Well, I think we've gone into 
the details and the the fineries of diversity and also uh, into a lot of um, challenges yeah. that diversity presents. Uh, shall we thank Sabine Engel for today's presentation? Uh, Let's do that. We did it alone. Um, thank you so much. Um, it was a great input and extremely interesting also for us here in Innsbruck, but hopefully also for the others uh, to learn a little bit more uh, on these uh, equal opportunity issues and uh, diversity strategies and so on. We came up here recently um, uh, at our university and um, we see each other if you want uh, again uh, next week of course um, same time same place uh, with colleagues from Palatsky University in Olomitz um, Pavlina Fleischerova and Jerry Fleischer um, who bring to us uh, again a different perspective diversity identity and success in higher education, a British and American perspectives. I mean, we, of course, we, we talk many times about um, uh, the American uh, also university system and, of course, American, you know, it is also uh, theory production as a background for our, um, uh, for our um, topic here, of course, also American politics. Um, but we haven't talked a lot about uh, the British uh, perspective and I think the interesting thing will be that they take it up from the side of literature, uh, how it's reflected in literary uh, texts. Uh, so uh, hopefully we see you again uh, next week. Thanks again Sabine Engel for the presentation today and uh, Thank have you. a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.